Okay, thanks uh, to Chris and the whole team from Bladder Cancer Canada for the invitation. I'm going to see if I can figure out how to advance this. Perfect. Yeah. No, thanks. So um, at the Ottawa Hospital, we have a great working relationship with the surgeons, radiation oncologists, pathologists. We really work as a team uh, to deal with bladder cancer, other urological cancers. We meet every Monday. We discuss difficult cases. Um, and so where the transition from, uh, say, someone like Chris, who's treating bladder cancer locally, um, to someone like myself who treats patients with drugs that fight cancer is when uh, bladder cancer becomes risky, as in when it gets into the muscle, or when the bladder cancer is actually spread. So that's the two instances where we're using drugs, and the traditional one has been chemotherapy. And so what are new drugs that <coughs> might be coming down the line now that we can use in these spaces that might be an advance? So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So this is the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Centre, the main site where we work, and also there's the Queensway Carleton Hospital. And we're the only site in all of eastern Ontario that delivers all of the drug treatment and orders it centrally, but we may order it out to Renfrew, order it to Cornwall, to Hawkesbury. So a lot of the, the expertise is centralized. That's a good thing in some ways in that we can communicate with our surgeons uh, uh, quite well and, and as it becomes a little bit more challenging for patients. But fortunately now with telemedicine, we can actually contact patients uh, from very far away. Um, and one thing I'd highlight as well is that we are very involved in clinical trials. We have a huge uh, network at the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Centre. We have 65 oncologists uh, at our centre um, we, but we have many study coordinators, research assistants, startup specialists for trials, data managers, pharmacists involved, um, technicians. So we have a, a very kind of well-oiled machine to run trials that make a difference in terms of uh, the next generation of drug treatments. So the conventional uh, treatments that we use are, of course, radiation, surgery, and chemotherapy. Um, and chemotherapy usually is where we may offer to someone at risk uh, that they may have recurrence outside of the bladder. So when, it when bladder cancer invades into the muscle, you know, some of these statistics might be 50-50% that it, it could recur outside. We clearly want to change some of those statistics, and that's when we've tried to use something like chemotherapy. However, we know that chemotherapy has a small uh, a bit of benefit there, and we want to be able to improve on that standard. So how are we trying to do that? Well, you know, about 10 years ago, when I was starting as an oncologist, bladder cancer was really famous for not having any advance in drug treatment, which is such a, uh, was such a shame at the time that we really put, we were trying to put a lot more effort into uh, developing new drugs. And how do we do that? We kind of, as a scientist, look at this wheel of different things that make cancer cancer, right? We, we look at uh, that it needs to grow new blood vessels, that it needs to evade the immune system, uh, that it may have certain growth factors that are very important. So the new things nowadays that are uh, really getting a lot of buzz are immunotherapy, um, this fibroblast growth factor, uh, and this nectin-targeted uh, therapy. So that's what I'm going to highlight for you today. So you may know that actually the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology was recently won in October for the development of immunotherapy by these two gentlemen. One is James P. Allison um, and all the way over in Japan, Takutsu Honjo. Um, and they really, um, immunotherapy is not a new idea, but they discovered something really key called immune checkpoints um, that have made immunotherapy possible. So what is immunotherapy? Immunotherapy is when we can use your own immune system to fight off uh, cancer. Um, so how does it really work? I'm going to try to highlight that. So at, the at, at this panel here, we really want a cell called the T cell in the body to be able to attack uh, a tumor cell here in the brown. Okay? And it, in order to do that, basically a cancer, as you can see in the brown here, needs to uh, 
breakdown, and part of the cancer needs to be taken up by a white cell that brings that bit of cancer into a lymph node and then trains the immune system against the cancer, okay? Um, and then that's this bar here where the uh, immune system is being trained against this bit of cancer. Then this T cell here multiplies, it, it you know, goes back into the bloodstream and tries to search and destroy that bit of cancer. And when it finds it, um, it can attack tumor cells, shrink it, and actually make it go away, some, um, and sometimes permanently. Um, so the, the discovery is that there are actually ways that the cancer here can cloak itself from this T cell, and that cloak is called PDL1. Uh, so that cloak there, if we can remove this cloak, suddenly this T cell can attack, and if we can actually remove this other cloak called CTLA4, more T cells can be trained against the cancer. So that's the Nobel Prize winning discovery. Um, and so, you know, some of the responses, I'll just give you an idea. Here's a patient with metastatic melanoma that after uh, treatment with both of these types of immune therapy has complete, near complete eradication of their cancer that was spread into their lungs. Um, so just to explain this another way, We've been doing immunotherapy for a long time, okay? We've been trying all kinds of ways to infuse um, basically uh, cytokines, uh, things like that you get when you have the flu, okay, like um, uh, interleukin-2. And so we've been, uh, we've been trying to vaccinate patients. We've been trying to do all kinds of things. And in the past, all of that was trying to step on the gas of the immune system, Okay. The problem is what we didn't realize before with immunotherapy is that we actually, the clutch was depressed in that car. I mean, I don't know how many of you drive stick shift, but <laughs> for those of you don't, that don't understand this, ask your neighbor, you'll get it. But if you, have, if you press on the clutch, you're not going anywhere, okay? That's basically the tenet of these immune checkpoint inhibitors. When we actually give a therapy that releases that clutch, the immune system can can go forward. So I guess the question is, why does immunotherapy work at all? Because, you know, the cancer has to look foreign to your immune system. Well, one of the key things about cancer generally is that it's mutated. It's changed from uh, the body. In fact, this is probably one of the only times you'll, I'll say that smoking was a good thing. Uh, because if you're, you had smoked, there are a lot of mutations in that cancer and the chance that it looks more foreign uh, to the body is higher, and the chance of immunotherapy working is higher as well. So this is, uh, no, I'm not saying that if you smoke, <laughs> immunotherapy is going to work. Rewind the tape. <laughs> Maybe I'll be, you know, not lecturing next year. <laughs> but in any case, the, the, the tenet here is that things that look foreign to the immune system you know, your immune system might try to get rid of it. Bladder cancer tends to be one of the higher mutated uh, cancers, but as you can see on this graph of mutational load in cancer, there's a wide range. Some, some people with bladder cancer have very few mutations, some have a lot of mutations, and that may affect how the immune system, how active it is for bladder cancer. So I pr I'm proud to say in, in Ottawa, we're actually, um, uh, we were a part of the development of one of these immunotherapies that is now Health Canada and FDA approved. We are part of the original phase one, two study, and we tested seven patients in Ottawa that led to the FDA approval of Dervalumab immunotherapy. Um, and this drug is being hotly studied uh, in this area, as including many other uh, drugs. So if you look at um, the NCCN guidelines uh, for bladder cancer, this is the US guidelines, uh, here are the, uh, basically, here's the list of the immunotherapies that are currently approved. Uh, pembrolizumab is a favored one after, say, platinum chemotherapy, but there are other ones like atezolizumab, nivolumab, drivalumab, nivalumab. Um, there are subtle differences between these drugs, but essentially the, it's all the same mechanism that I've, I've just highlighted. So what are we doing in Ottawa? Now, you can see on this graph, okay, 2001 to 2018, uh, this is the surge in use of immunotherapy. Now, this is not just bladder cancer. This is all cancer types, okay? But this is number of inf immunotherapy infusions per month. And we were doing probably like 
10 back in 2015, and we're almost at 300 uh, a month currently. So this is, uh, you can see, this is hitting lung cancer in a big way, skin cancer, which I treat, but also uh, urological cancer here is the third one. So we're making uh, a large use of these types of drugs for many different types of indications. Now, there are potential downsides of immunotherapy. When we try to get the immune system to attack the cancer, well, your immune system can actually attack your own body uh, as a side effect. Um, actually, the PD-1 drugs as a class, relatively well tolerated. We've even done placebo-controlled uh, trials where we couldn't tell like, you know, if a patient was getting a drug or not. Um, so uh, when you're using the immune trainer, the CTLA-4 one, yeah, there can be a little bit more side effects. And when you use the two of them together, which is the standard of care in some uh, cancers, you can have a lot of side effects. So we're looking at different mechanisms in Ottawa to try and optimize and even prevent some of these side effects from occurring while still getting that uh, cancer-fighting immunotherapy effect that we want. Now, I just want to highlight as well that chemotherapy can still be uh, very effective. And here's a recent trial of, um, I was supposed to not show Kaplan Myers, <laughs> but basically um, this trial showed that if you have not bladder cancer, but cancer that started in the upper tracts, if we incorporate chemotherapy, there was a 50% reduction in the risk of recurrence from this trial. Okay, so uh, we're not saying that immunotherapy will replace Chemotherapy, in fact, a lot of the trials now, now undergoing uh, are combining both, uh, and we're trying to figure out the, the proper way of doing things. I'll skip this slide because it's confusing. Um, there's a few other new drugs on, on the block that are just investigational, but just highlights some of the work that we're doing. One technology that we're using is called antibody drug conjugates. Uh, and basically what it is is you get one antibody that, that, that we can make uh, that can hone in on certain tissues in the body that are, uh, it's, it's basically like there's a flag on the cancer called Nectin-4, okay? And if we create an antibody that tries to hone in on Nectin-4, then we can actually get that antibody to bind right to the cancer. And then what's happened here is that they've actually attached a little bomb onto that, that, that tag. So the Nectin-4 is attached to a chemotherapy. Uh, and once it hones directly to the cancer, it actually sucks it into the cancer and it releases that chemotherapy only to the cancer. So this drug has just been tested uh, in patients that were refractory to all treatment. Um, and it showed actually some really promising results. So this is going into you know, bigger trials right now and, and may become something, uh, uh, you know, in the future. And another one that we're currently testing here um, in Ottawa is called fibroblast growth factor receptor inhibitors. Uh, these two different drugs, rogaratinib and erdafitinib, uh, they basically, there's a growth signal on in some bladder cancers, okay? It's called fibroblast growth factor. Uh, and if it's on, then we have a drug that can turn that switch off, that growth factor off. Um, and so what we have to do for this is we actually have to test patients' tumor samples, see if they have that switch that's on. If they have the switch that's on, then we could test this. Again, these are early days for these drugs, but um, you know, two avenues that are making waves um, for sure. So uh, I've just highlighted the immunotherapy, those two different new classes of drugs, and how do we take these new tools and make a difference in bladder cancer uh, patients for, for sure. So what we know now is that we can improve the survival um, of patients and sometimes long-term survival of patients that have recurred and may have bladder cancer that spread elsewhere, like lung or liver, okay? But that's kind of treating patients when the cat's kind of out of the bag and it's hard to make a big difference at that stage. Now, what we're doing is we're actually trying to use it, drugs like immunotherapy much earlier. We're trying to use it immediately after surgery uh, in randomized trials, okay? Uh, to see if it actually helps to improve the cure rate. 
we're going to have trials that are upcoming that actually give immunotherapy after we've given radiation to see if it can improve how long the radiation works. We um, can actually combine it together uh, with radiation at the same time, um, uh, together with chemotherapy, that's the, the usual standard. And then some new studies are in fact looking at it before surgery. So um, our standard, say for muscle invasive bladder cancer, is to do chemotherapy before surgery, but actually now we're going to be opening up a study of doing chemotherapy with immunotherapy before surgery um, compared to chemotherapy alone to see if it's an improvement. Um, and then there are even studies now looking at patients uh, that have uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, but say have been multiply recurrent. So say you're a candidate for BCG or you're a candidate for some of these uh, uh, multiple resections, uh, we're trying to test to see if these immunotherapies are going to help. In fact, there is some early data to say that um, there's a good response rate, but I'd say looking at the data so far, it's too early to really know. And the problem is when you go really early uh, in a setting where, you know, it's not likely that you're uh, going to get cancer out of the bladder, right, that's not going to invade and spread, then that's when the potential side effects of immunotherapy might outweigh the potential benefits. So there's so much to learn right now about how we use these immunotherapies, how we incorporate these new drugs for uh, cancer. Uh, we're conducting trial after trial after trial. We have to turn down trials because we just don't have the manpower to do it. So I'd say, you know, really the efforts that you make, you all make, in terms of supporting research, um, are, are, you know, are very, very important. So I appreciate you and I applaud you and your support for those kind of endeavors. Um, and uh, we have uh, just a fantastic staff uh, here at the hospital that, 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 you know, you should see these uh, research staff. They really dedicate uh, themselves to their patients um, and uh, they make that extra effort so that this can all happen. So thanks very much for your attention. and. Uh,